BDS Marketing presents The Hype Hour with your hosts, Andrew Catapano and Kelly Campbell, featuring special guests, Sean Ludick, Zachary Drexler, and John Rodney. Today's topic, Contactless Shopping, Part 2. Rebuilding consumer confidence through safe yet engaging and memorable shopping experiences. Let's get started. Here are your hosts. Welcome to the Hive and another edition of the Hype Hour with me as always, yeah. Miss Kelly Campbell. How are, Kelly, Kelly, before I start the show, I brought my salt. I'm not sure what, what shoulder it goes over, but it has been auspicious beginnings. We, we've got a down camera. Kelly almost didn't make the show. I heard Sean Ludic lost his accent for 10 minutes. I, I don't know what's going on, but we're here, <laughs> we're live, and we're ready to get started, are we not? We are. I know. As they say, it's showbiz, right? So we're in this. We're live streaming live, so anything can happen, I guess, right? But you know what? We roll with it, and uh, we are excited to be here. So well, I'm excited to be here. Happen. Part two, rebuilding consumer confidence through safe yet engaging memorable shopping experiences. Kelly, who do we have today? Yeah, well, we know that shopper safety is here to stay and it's going to be an important piece to the overall experience going forward. So we have Sean Ludic, BDS board member and former Microsoft executive here back again to chat through what consumers are expecting when it comes to safety and the whole experience in stores. Um, and then we also have Zachary Drexler here today, business intelligence manager for BDS, coming on to talk about uh, the new shopper safety score from BDS, what factors into it, and how retailers can utilize this to really improve the experience overall. So I'm really excited to hear more about that later from him. And then lastly, we have John Rodman, Head of Experience Platforms for the Worldwide Channel Marketing team at Microsoft here today. He's going to help us frame up this new what this new contactless experience looks like for the future and answer some of our burning questions around how to still create a great experience for shoppers at retail. Kelly, why don't you tell us the ground rules because I've got a couple. One, yeah. don't make well, fun first, of that hat. I think he's one of the best hatted men I've ever met. <laughs> That's rule number one. I love that hat. And he's one of the only guys wearing the hat, right? So what are the other ground rules, Kelly? I know, right? He's the only one today wearing a hat. I guess we I all missed the memo. Point. It's one of those days, right? Uh, but if you did miss part one of contactless shopping, uh, that discussion last month, visit thehypehive.com. There was a recap there for you, along with all of the other hype hours that we've done so far. And then just a reminder to comment and join in on the conversation with your questions, and we'll get to them. Well, Kelly, let's dive straight into it, shall we? All right. I'm going to see you later in the show, right, Kelly? You're going to take on Zach. I'm looking yeah. forward to that one-on-one, -on -one, and we're going to see you and Zach later in the show, but I'm going to take on Mr. Ludic to start, correct? Sounds good. You got it. Fantastic. Okay. Today, we have Sean Ludic. Sean Ludic is a welcome guest to the show, has been here a few times, been here since the beginning, BDS board, uh, board member, former Microsoft executive, on to talk about what is happening with consumer confidence these days. Listen, Sean is not only a global renowned channel marketing veteran, proven track record of, uh, of building successful go-to-marketing teams, industry event management, end-to-end -end omni-channel sales, marketing infrastructures, an all-around global expert, heck of a guy, always on the pulse of what's happening in the industry. Quite frankly, he is the Gupta to my Cooper he is the Fauci to my Trump, the Bert to my Ernie. Welcome back to the Hype Hour, Mr. Sean Ludwig. Come on into the Hive. Hey, Andrew, how are you? I'm fantastic, Sean. It is always a pleasure to see you. Um, love having you. Love the information you have to share. And I know you're going to jump right into it. You have a nice presentation for us with a ton of good data. And I know people love hearing your insights. You ready to roll? Ready to roll. Look, thank you, Andrew. Very happy to be here and uh, excited to talk a bit about kind of where we're seeing consumer confidence, uh, not only here in the United States, but what are some of the lessons that we can learn from other parts of the world? 
I think is going to be important for us. So let's get stuck in and let's move to the first slide, which I want to share with you, which is around U.S. retail. So as you can see here on this chart, let's focus on the left side. You will see a line chart there, which the blue line represents consumer sentiment. And we're tracking it from July 2019 to July 2020. And then the other line on the chart is the dotted line, which is the um, U.S. cumulative coronavirus cases trend line. So no, no secret, we see a massive decline in consumer confidence in uh, March, April timeframe uh, this year, of course, when uh, we, you know, COVID became really relevant and pandemic started to really spread. So you see the massive spike in, in, uh, in the cases. So, of course, everything shut down, consumer confidence at an all time low. And then as you start coming into uh, June, we start reopening. You see the you see the consumer confidence get everybody getting excited and going back into uh, into store into retail. And then guess what happens? We have another resurgence of it, and of course, uh, you see consumer confidence declining. And what's what's kind of interesting for me on this slide is is a couple of things. And you know, I say this statement with all positivity because um, there's nobody more proud to be part of, uh, uh, proud to be American than I am. But, and I say this statement with, with a lot of positivity, but freedom often comes at a price. And what I mean by that, and, and, and this is how it relates to, to the confidence chart is that, look, traditionally and culturally, Americans are a very proud, independent, and people, and they fiercely protect their freedoms against anyone who they feel may be impinging on it. So you have that together stoked by a lot of division in the country, right? You, you, this, this discord and, and government created this, this convoluted and various response to pandemic across the United States. So there was a lot of confusion, I think, and, uh, you know, a lot of questions uh, that happened. So that didn't really help with the, the confidence that we, uh, that we see. But even though, you know, as I said, uh, the reopening of the economy was, you know, met with a, a massive enthusiasm from certain uh, demographics, which, of course, uh, gave us uh, the surge that we see. Now, if you look to the right side of the chart, uh, you see some other interesting statistics here in the United States and actually not bad, not bad when you when you think about the opening of restaurants. We only see, we've seen actually a percent increase in confidence and people going out to eat. But when you look at going to a shopping mall, it's literally a percent decline in between June and July. And then other activities, we're also only seeing about a percent decline going from 20 to 19. And that's things like attending gyms, movies, museums, concerts that sort of stuff. Um, so I think overall, I think we're all very aware of where we are in the United States. And it's actually just an interesting way to, to uh, show you sort of some of the trends that are happening here. So if we go to the, to the next slide, uh, and I'd like to just talk to you quickly about uh, the United Kingdom and what we're seeing in the UK. Again, keeping to the same chart, no secret. When we see the massive decline happening in March, April was obviously at the onset of this uh, pandemic. Um, you see the rise of the pandemic and then you see obviously that decline. But then you saw, uh, let's say sort of uh, June, early June, July, you see a, a great spike in confidence. Uh, although the economy reopened there, they were a lot more cautious in their reopening. Even though confidence went up, um, they were a lot more cautious and sort of very similar to the United States, I think. Um, you know, the UK, you know, the government got things right, but they also got things wrong. And I think also created some confusion there and there were some negative impacts there and some misfires. And basically only 50%, you know, of, of, um, of retail in, in high street 
uh, is, is open today in, in the United Kingdom. So that just gives you a bit of insight into what's going on in, in, in the UK as it relates to that. If we go to the next slide, please. And I, and I want to double click on this one because this one was very interesting for me, Japan. Um, one of my favorite countries in Asia, uh, Japan. Um, again, you see, you see the, the massive decline and uh, you, you see the spike in coronavirus, very similar to, to the UK and to the US. But, you know, what was very interesting, though, although you see, you know, consumer confidence versus the cumulative cases, uh, they may appear to show a steep increase of cases, but the number of cases is actually considerably low when adjusted for the population. But look at that spike in confidence. Look at that when you from April up, you just see this massive spike in consumer confidence. And it really comes down to one thing. Culture norms impact everything in Japan. And the reason why I say that in Japan, and if, if you've had the fortunate opportunity to visit Japan, a couple of things that, are, that, are, that stand out for us. And I think one of the reasons why you see such a speedy uh, um, mitigation and return to confidence. One, because everyone in Japan is used to wearing masks. It's part of their culture. They walk around with masks on. It's nothing new. It's what they do. So that's just embedded in the culture. They avoid a lot of touching. They have kind of kind of avoid shaking hands. They're very respectful uh, uh, um, nation. Uh, you don't see a lot of hugging and, and stuff like that. And when they get home, they take off their shoes. And so they have this, this natural cultural uh, um, sense of, of what they're doing to be very, I would say, conservative in the way they, they treat and do things. So I think that's helped a lot in Japan to really start stemming the, the, the cases of, of coronavirus, but also really build a lot of confidence with the Japanese consumer there. So uh, that was a really good one. If we go to the next slide, please. And this one uh, is for China. And this is an interesting chart. As you can, again, same sort of so January, you see the massive spike in, in uh, coronavirus, obviously uh, the epicenter of, of the origins of, of uh, COVID and the, obviously the decline. But look at that, look at that chart there on the, on the left where you see consumer confidence really spike up in uh, sort of um, February, March, but then the massive decline. And you sort of wonder when you look at the chart, well, uh, coronavirus cases seem to be reportedly at a, a decline, a very slight incline, but decline. They seem to have the, the cases under control, but consumer confidence continues to drop. And sort of as we looked at the research there, we were wondering why there was that sort of trend happening. And a couple of things, I think, uh, with regards to China, when we look at consumers, um, even though uh, we we know that uh, you know reported by the media that uh, China's had an incredibly well coordinated and immediate response to the pandemic, uh, you know unbelievable effectiveness in infection rates and actually being one of the most populous countries in the world, uh, they were very disciplined and uh, kind of autocratic in the way that they uh, uh, um, sort of ensured that the economy uh, kind of shut down or the, the stay at home orders. They did a very good job with that. But with the, with the Chinese adults, we're seeing um, a lot of concern around uh, or uncertainty around this. China relies a lot of, uh, on exports and imports, but we, we see that uh, half of Chinese adults today believe that the coronavirus will neg negatively impact uh, uh, their jobs and their finances. So therefore, they are spending less uh, because they're keeping, uh, making sure they're saving, saving their, their, their income. So you see a lot of negative impact on confidence, less spending, hence the decline uh, with consumers there. Um, so if we go to the next slide, I kind of like this slide because it gives us a world view and, and go sort of a side by side. And I spoke to you about you, the US, China, Japan, and United Kingdom, and I added two more there, which is Germany and France. And it's a kind of a nice 
world view of, of the trends of consumer confidence and, and the spikes. And I would say if we just look at Germany and France here, yeah, I would say very, very similar with regards to uh, the response as well as the, the confidence levels of, of consumers. And if I think about Germany, one thing about Germany, they, they weren't one of the first countries to, uh, to you know, uh, get the virus. So they had some time to really study what was going on around the world and actually build plans to, uh, to get ready for the pandemic. And on top of that, you know, Germany has one of, uh, you know, one of the most uh, uh, robust public health systems in the world. And, uh, you know, they use a lot of data uh, to really help them do that. And the, the German public themselves were very disciplined themselves about self-quarantining without being told to stay at home, which helped that. So they're seeing, they seeing good positive increase in, in, in confidence and uh, stability in, in viruses. And with France, uh, very similar to Germany, same sort of thing. Um, you know, France also, but they had a, they had a very strict rock, uh, lockdown for two months. And um, they deployed a ton of these mobile testing centers. And I think I really helped uh, you know, consumers there feel a lot more safe and confident about um, the country's response to uh, to the virus. So this was just a nice world overview of of how people are feeling around the world. Uh, what are their confidence levels about returning to retail, and like what can we learn from this? So if we go to the next and final slide, please. I kind of just wanted to summarize like what can we take away from all of this here and I try to keep it very simple into three simple things. You know, the first one is as Americans in the United States, I think we have to be ready and we're seeing a great response from retailers uh, today where um, a lot of them are actually mandating the fact that we need to wear masks, such a simple thing. Um, and if you look at some of the statistics there in May, only 63% of, of, of the public felt comfortable wearing masks, whereas you look at July 2020, 72% of people now are in favor of wearing masks. I think this is such an important way to help mitigate, but also drive confidence levels up so people can come back into store and start shopping again, which is what we want. The second one, um, which, I, which I'd like to impress on everybody, is this authenticity, this be authentic. And... Consumers want to see brands being authentic, not cookie cutter. And, and when I say cookie cutter, I, I don't mean that in any disrespect. If I look at the, the airline industry, for example, and I'm sure most of you have, the, have had the same thing. I, you know, I, I have the uh, travel multiple airlines and I've received emails from a lot of the, the CEOs. I'm sure all their consumers have received emails from the CEOs to say, hey, this is what we, this is our response. And this is what we're going to do to make sure you're safe. But they seem to be all the same. They don't seem to be very authentic in their approach. So I think what people are looking for, especially different demographics, are looking for more authenticity about this, about like what are we going to do as a brand, not only to make sure that everybody's safe coming into store, but like are we, are, are we putting um, – part of our sales into research? Are we doing something different? Are we driving more ability to go and get safety equipment for hospitals? I don't know. These are just ideas. So authenticity is important. And then the last one, uh, which I think Zach is going to talk a lot about, is, is being safe. And I love all the promises I'm seeing from retailers today and, and laying out and being very open and transparent about what they're doing to ensure that uh, when shopping in their stores, they are going to be very safe. That we have to continue to drive and we have to be very diligent on that. And, you know, I know BDS is working on some amazing things like a shopper safety score, uh, which will help not only uh, the retailer feel confident that their promise is being met, but also help the consumer feel very confident and excited about coming back to retail. So, Andrew, that's in summary uh, of, of what I have, and that's sort of my final slide. And, uh, you know, yeah, I, 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 I'm being very cautiously optimistic about the future. I'm, I'm definitely seeing some really good signals. 
uh, I'm confident that the you know things will get back on track. And if we just follow these three simple things, I think uh, I think things will go well. Well, Sean, I- I- insightful as always. Um, I really do appreciate it. You brought up something in Japan. They, they didn't do a lot of hugging. I, I got to be honest with you. Uh, a 300 pound Italian dad and growing up with a Jewish mom, uh, that would have been trouble in my house. That's all we did. So we were we would have been the hot spot, unfortunately. Uh, mm-hmm. but question. So again, uh, you know, I mean, hopefully not a curveball, but uh, but I do want to ask you. You know, you've laid out you laid out uh, wear masks, authentic, be safe. I gotta ask, do you think retailers are doing enough? Let's put on the mind of a hat of a customer right now. Are are is it taking too long for these things to happen? Do you think we're right on time? Are the, are we not going fast enough? Is this the normal speed of things? And, and, and if not, why did it take so long? Or do you think retailers are right on track and we're adapting where we're supposed to? I mean, if you're putting on a customer hat, are we ready? Yeah, I mean, so a couple of things. There's no such thing as normal, right? I, you know, I don't think anybody could have thought or planned for this. And do I think our retail partners are doing enough? Absolutely. I think they are doing a fantastic job. Um, I'm just loving what I'm seeing. Uh, the, the, the focus and the dedication from retailers to make sure that the shopping experience is going to be safe. I couldn't be more, uh, more confident and, and more excited about what retailers are doing. I think they're doing an outstanding job. No one would have, uh, no one understands what, you know, this could have happened to us. So I, I think uh, we are doing the right thing. I think the retailers are doing the right thing. Um, you know, I think just continue to drive that that uh, um, that mass policy, that authenticity, and and the, and just make sure that they they commit to their promise of making the experience safe. Uh, I think we we on the right track. Commit to the promise. I, that's that's the slogan. I love it. And I actually, you know, I was a branding expert. That's that's fantastically wrapped up, Sean. Commit to the promise. Yep. I love it. Sean, thank you for your time. Insightful as always. And I look forward to having you on a future episode. Thank you, Andrew. Have a good show. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Wow. Such amazing insights as we saw consumer confidence, you know, from Sean is a little bit wavering more than ever before, but not only here in some other countries around the world, depending on where you are. So how do we really get consumers to feel confident in visiting visiting stores in person again? I actually think that question is perfect for our next guest, Zach Drexler, who is the business intelligence manager at BDS. From data modeling, visualization, reporting development, if you wanna talk numbers, he is your guy. One of the many instrumental solutions that he has created for BDS is a new rating system that Sean actually mentioned a little bit, um, but it's one that retailers can use to evaluate their own shopper safety um, going forward. Um, But I'll let him talk more about what that is. So let's bring Zach on board to talk a little bit about what the shopper safety score is. Thanks for joining me, Zach. Absolutely, good to see you, Kelly. Yeah, it's great to have you on. Very excited. I'm sure everybody's dying to know a little bit more about what this rating system is, what goes into it. Um, Can you tell us a little bit more about what the shopper safety score is and sort of how it came to be? Absolutely. I'd love to. So as we all know, there's a lot of shoppers who are still concerned about returning to locations and making their purchases in the physical store itself. Now, Sean touched on some interesting information regarding consumer confidence and the declining trends we've seen over the last couple of weeks. So Mm -hmm. in response to the coronavirus pandemic, a lot of retailers have taken new measures and they've implemented new protocols, such as more routine cleaning, requiring the usage of face masks, uh, having contest checkout, all of these being put into place to create a safe shopping environment. This message has become so important that many of these retailers are advertising this information on their storefronts and on their websites. This is a promise to the customers mm-hmm. what they can expect when they go into these locations and be able to shop safely. And if you take a look at this slide, you'll see such an example of a well-known retailer. Now, BDS is happy to announce that we've created a new industry norm to measure the fulfillment of these promises, and which is what we're calling the shopping safety score. For all the retailers on today's call, what BDS is actually offering you is this third-party perception 
to give you the ability to demonstrate that you are committing to your promise. As a retail partner, we understand the importance of keeping your customers safe, and we understand that the implementation of new protocols, especially across the nation, isn't as easy as flipping a switch. So we've built the Shopper Safe Score to help retailers identify the state of their safety executions and assist them in bringing those customers back into those locations. This, of course, is proprietary information, so it's not made available to the general public or other retailers, but it can be proudly displayed on the storefront with a official physical decal or demonstrated online. Awesome. I mean, that sounds really impressive. And I know if we're talking about the best way to reinstill consumer confidence, this could be a little bit of the ticket. This could have all the buzz, right? So, um, but I think all of us are wondering, you know, what goes into developing a scoring system like this? What, what does it entail? Are there things that are weighed more heavily than others? Um, you know, can you shed a little light on sort of what goes into it? Absolutely. Let's talk nerdy. So <laughs> look at the science behind the score. So we use insight data-driven collection methods and mm -hmm. our scoring methodologies that we've designed based on primary and secondary research that we've conducted. So we don't operate arbitrarily. We have done our homework and we realize that there's certain policies that are going to instill more consumer confidence at higher levels than others. So we've designed our methodologies with these considerations because we want to optimize the data that we pull out of these insights. And during our execution, we take a sample of locations and we select these to optimize statistical validity and reduce variance. Each location is treated as observation scored independently. And then by conducting statistical analysis on top of that sample, we can determine a score for the overall retailer. Nice. So, I mean, that's amazing. So there's a few different components that obviously go into it. Um, compared to some of the other maybe scoring systems that we've seen pop up here and there, how is the shopper safety score different? I mean, is how might this give retailers like a complete competitive edge uh, when it comes to consumer safety needs and expectations, knowing that that's probably going to be a huge component of, uh, of the experience going forward for shoppers? No, that's an excellent question. And I have seen those scores that you're referring to. I've seen them all around the web. What's pretty <laughs> interesting about those is they grade the conceptual elements of the policy. That is, they'll assign an A or a B or a C, depending on the number of policies or what specific policies the retailer is promising. These are often sourced from the website. And, you know, Target and Best Buy and all these retail chains, they'll receive a grade based on what they're promising. Mm -hmm. Conversely, our score looks at the real world execution of this, these promises. Rather than grading the promise itself, we determine our score based on the actual execution of the specified elements of that promise outlined in that official policy. And this criteria is classified and organized into four different classification types, which are sanitation, safety protocols, social distancing, and added convenience. Mm -hmm. And we use graded grading when we evaluate each one of these classifications because we want to ensure that we're placing the proper amount of emphasis on the actions that the data itself is indicated will bring customers back into locations and make them feel more safe. Yeah. And as a product, we also track additional criteria that's not necessarily contained within the scope of the original promise, but we are seeing that executed in the industry as a total. So it doesn't count into the score, but it does make for some interesting insights when we're digging deeper into the data. That actually is interesting because we got a few questions from the audience, um, which I think aligns with a little bit of what we're talking about here with those extra sort of outlier pieces. Um, mm -hmm. How will the shopper safety score account for different safety procedures, you know, for different retailers going forward? Um, is that something that they would see that's more of like that outlier thing for right now? Or is that going to eventually, you know, get rolled in? No, absolutely. So again, when we're grading the core promise for each individual retailer, it's based on their criteria. We're not holding them to something that might be necessarily outside their scope, but we do track that for that additional insight. Mm, got it. So you see that within another retail chain, they have a practice that's not being executed in another retailer, but we're seeing success. And we can see some correlation between uh, performance indicators such as improved sales or foot traffic. We can make that known that you know that, that is, this is now a new practice that has proven efficiencies. It could be a new consideration in that retailer's policy promise. Got it. Oh, that makes total sense. So let's say, for example, like what would a retailer see on their end? Like what does that visual look like for them? And, you know, when they're evaluating their their strategies going forward, what does that look like? Absolutely. Well, in the next slide, we'll see how we summarize our studies. Oh, awesome. So we have a safety scorecard. 
And this is an example, example of an actual score for a retailer today. As we mentioned, the scoring under each classification considers only that criteria that's specified in that policy, right? So it's indicated by that circular shape around the score. Now, these criteria is gonna roll up underneath that classification score, underneath those four classifications, which will score in individually so we can see an indicator where they perform amongst those certain types of actions. Those are then weighted and calculated to bring us to the final shopper safety score. And you'll notice there are some fields in the grid that don't have that circular shape. These are that additional criteria. So we can see where a retailer is pacing in terms of those executions, where their average is at. And if we are seeing that it has an effect, a positive effect out in the field, this would be an open discussion about, you know, we may want to focus on implementing these, we could see some positive return. So again, they do not factor into the score itself, but it yeah. makes for very interesting insights when we're doing the analysis. And, and that can, sorry, one question that came up from the audience, Zach, actually, don't mean to interrupt, but um, that does kind of align, right? I, one of the questions was, will the shopper safety score adjust to new regulations as they come out? Is that something that would then show up in that, um, in that scorecard as well, potentially, or be an option to have available at some Absolutely. point? And that's why we've chosen to record that external, sort of that beyond the scope of the water okay. industry practices. So we can look back and see if that is determined to be a final product, like an actual part of criteria, the gold standard, we'll have that scored for that retailer. Got it. Cool. Awesome. And then I, I know like you have some extra analysis that goes into it, right? Can you tell us a little bit more about diving into that? Absolutely. So the underlying data set itself, because we're taking a sample of the field and we're seeing these scores individually as different observations, there's more potential for analysis than just beyond the score itself. So as a partner, we can help distill all of that information into powerful insights to assist with these new strategies. For example, by observing the distribution of scores across a heat map as the one depicted here, we can identify that performance landscape and understand where the successes are, where the challenges are, and where there's opportunities to improve. So by pinpointing these hotspots, we can understand you know, which locations are fulfilling the promise most efficiently. Mm -hmm. There's probably some very good knowledge there from the store management and the store employees that can help facilitate that communication and shed light on those best practices and help those locations that are facing a little bit more challenges fulfilling that promise. We can also yeah. test and analyze for correlation between the shopper safety score and as I previously mentioned, against other performance indicators such as sales or foot traffic. I know that in the circumstances we find ourselves, I'm sure many of us would be interested in to see which <laughs> store are having the fastest and most stable return of foot traffic into those locations after they're reopening from their closures. Oh, yeah, for sure. I would be personally interested to see that. I mean, I just feel like I read the book on shopper safety a little bit, getting a, a debrief from like a professor. Um, what I do love, though, is how easy the score is to understand, even though there's a lot of pieces and it's um, complex of everything that goes into it. I also love that it's telling me what's happening in the real world and giving me that true, authentic lay of the land, you know, in my stores. And um, so for all of those who are maybe just looking for a really easy next step to figuring out how they can get a hold of their score, you know, what can they do? Is there anything that they could they could take as a next step? Yep, if they're interested in participating or would like to learn more about the score, we have additional information on our website. So I would say, please don't hesitate to go to bdsmarketing.com slash shopper safety score and inquire today. We'll also provide some additional details after this live stream. Awesome. And I know uh, we're, before we jump to the next uh, section of the stream, I do want to bring up one uh, of our audience questions. We've had actually a few come through. Um, do you envision a method to view retailer safety scores online prior to store visits? Um, you know, are, is there a way for people to sort of envision what the safety would look like going into the store, talking, you know, kind of getting a baseline so that maybe even they could sort of see, you know, what might be missing or, or have some visual cues. Is there anything um, that we can talk to about that? Well, absolutely. Well, at this time, this information is intended for the retailer's insights. So although it's yeah. not made to the general public or publicized to other retailers, the store itself can indicate digitally on their website or within the storefront itself of their shopper safety score. Awesome. Well, yeah, and definitely for anybody who else who has 
tons of questions about the shopper safety score, feel free to reach out uh, to BDS and um, Zach could probably answer them for you. So uh, thanks so much, Zach, for joining us. Also, I forgot to mention the hat and it was super cool. So thank you for wearing the hat. Love it. Um, but yeah, I think, thank you so much for coming on board. That was really insightful and Hopefully the shopper safety score improves the shopping experience overall for everybody. Thanks so for we're actually gonna go back to Andrew. Thanks, Zach. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Andrew, back in the hive. Fantastic uh, information from Zach. I actually, uh, can, do we have, can we bring Kelly back in just for one second? Cause I wanna ask her uh, something quickly. I don't know that we can, I'm really getting John going here uh back in the booth but so kelly interesting question you just asked at the end audience question i as a, as the leader of of digital at bds and, and been doing marketing digital strategy for uh most of my natural life um allowing people to see their shopper safety score before they go in store an idea did hit me to attach it to your locations listing in your google maps profile so if yeah. you're doing research on a specific store and you're looking for the address, obviously we're all familiar with the Google's Maps locator yeah. and the image uh, selector inside of that, you could absolutely post your shopper score inside of your Google Maps listing. And that could be a one-to-one -one, uh, integration with that platform. So uh, actually yeah. very interesting. We could, uh, that, that got my brain working of, of course, <laughs> we do that research, but Great. I, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry you didn't ask him how long it took to grow that beard. If our audience <laughs> is on to the, the well, .com, if you look at, that is the picture of Zach. Like, go look at that picture after this show and tell me how long it takes to grow that beard. I don't know when that picture was taken, but Kelly, thank you. Outstanding job. Yeah, no, I think just to add to that, I think that is why we're here is, you know, these are supposed to start spark really great ideas. So hopefully coming out of this, everybody can sort of think about, um, you know, what does that look like for me? What does that um, aspect of the experience look like? So if it's shopper safety and that's something that you're going to hang your hat on, very important to figure out how you're going to do that from digital to in-store to in-person, all kinds of stuff. So hopefully that sparked a few ideas for some other uh, viewers as well. I know it did for me. Kelly, thank you again. Uh, I appreciate it. We'll see you at the end of the show. Awesome. All right. Paper's a little out of order, but we're going to get through it. So we have the anchor to our show. Um, and for our final guest today, a two five year veteran of Microsoft consumer product marketing. Mr. John Robin played an integral part in the retail launch of every Xbox console, including the original, the OG, back in November of 2001, the Xbox Live online service and Xbox's first party sports franchises, NFL Fever, NBA Inside Drive, NHL Rivals, MLB Inside Pitch. John started his career at Microsoft as an advertising manager launching Microsoft Office 95 and the packaging design lead for Microsoft Office 97. Man, I feel like I'm hitting a time capsule. I did, all this stuff is blowing me away. John seemed destined to land at Microsoft, having spent the previous five years prior to landing in Redmond, working on the Microsoft account at, at uh, Ogilvy and Mather Advertising in LA. I am proud to buzz into the hive, Mr. John Rodman. John, welcome to The Hive, and thank you for being our guest here today. Thank you, Andrew. Delighted and honored to be here, uh, a part of a, a great lineup of guests and conversation. So thank you. Fantastic. We are going to get right into it, John, because I know people want to hear you talk way more than they want to hear me talk. All right. The first thing is, John, let's just tee it up, right? 25 years at Microsoft, um, uh, retail channel marketing senior manager. What? What? What is... The three PP, what is it that John does? What do you do on a day-to-day -day basis, John? And, and, and why are we listening? And we're going to be listening very closely. Why? Tell me what it is that you do for the guests at home. Sure, Andrew. My team is the Retail Experiences Platform team. And what we do is we develop the platforms and the solutions that allow our third-party retailers to deploy our uh, demo and interactive experiences, 
our LMS solutions like Expert Zone, as well as our field labor uh, enablement and, and measurement tools like the Rep Tool. Uh, so again, my team builds those platforms and then works with a third-party ecosystem to deploy those solutions. All right. Well, John, uh, I'm going to call you Daryl Strawberry because we're going to start with a curveball, man. We're going to get right into it. We know that things have changed because of COVID-19, right? I got to ask. I'm going to ask it right at the point. How has that changed the retail experience approach for Microsoft? What are you guys doing different? What are you guys doing the same? Well, as Sean mentioned at the top of the show, uh, consumers are obviously being way more careful now, more deliberate, thoughtful, planful, whether they're just going to the grocery store, uh, you know, for a quick item or, or spending the whole weekend uh, running errands. And, and so, you know, this is the new normal. Uh, I think, you know, Sean again touched on that and, and we're embracing that here at Microsoft. Uh, and the way we're doing it is to kind of take that vision that Saudi Nadella had uh, when he uh, became CEO about creating a mobile first, digital first strategy, and then infusing that into everything we're doing, helping our partners execute a safe uh, retail environment for their customers to be able to continue shopping uh, and learning more about the products that we're selling with them. Uh, you know, there's two parts to this though, right? We've got to empower our customers to be able to continue to evaluate, compare, discover uh, all the devices and, and the uh, solutions in the Windows Consumer Channel ecosystem. But we also have to help our partners create those environments and, and, and create that consumer confidence that allows the customer to continue shopping the way they have in the past, at least in terms of being able to make informed purchase decisions. Well, well then that's, then that's the segue, John. So, right. So at the end of the day, you know, develop the, We all know we need to be safe. We all listen to Sean. We all listen to uh, 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 Zach. And then we know safety is there. But sometimes we've got this safety protocol that infringes on the experience protocol. So how do we bridge that gap and, and where do we go? Where do we see the future of third party retailer being safe, keeping the distance, keeping the mask, but not handicapping or truncating the experience that's going to be so important to driving that brand uh, conversion? Yeah. And so we know that everyone has their own comfort zone, right? Some people just want to stay in their homes and, you know, shop remotely using either their laptops or their mobile devices. Uh, others, you know, as they kind of move through the purchase journey and through the funnel and they get into the store, they may actually be more comfortable uh, being around other customers, being around a retail pro or an associate, and maybe even actually walking up and touching that device. So what we're doing at Microsoft is again, taking that digital first e-commerce approach and providing not only our customers with that scalable kind of safe journey to continue shopping, but doing it in a way that meets their comfort levels, right? If they're okay going into the store and talking to an associate or engaging with a device, then we're going to provide a rich set of demo experiences and, and engagements in the store that will still allow them to maintain uh, safe distancing and, and maintain the hygiene that's so important to them. And quite frankly, equally as important to our partners and their associates. Um, one of the things that we've done already is to deploy these PPE kits to our field teams so that when they're going into the stores and helping our partners say roll over a, a merchandising set for a new selling season, uh, is that they're able to you know, wear the mask, keep their hands sanitized, you know, we provide uh, ultraviolet, uh, you know, sanitizers for their phones. So we've got to, you know, kind of make sure the customer feels safe and confident that we're there with them every step of the way. We've got to make sure the retail partner understands that we're going to help create these environments that are going to allow them to offer the safe selling uh, environments in their stores, but also making sure that when we're engaging with either the partner or the customer that we're being safe uh, and, and, and uh, you know, practicing the right uh, hygiene and, and practices to keep everybody healthy. John, I, uh, 
uh, obviously you, you've got your finger on the pulse. You know how to bridge that gap in between safety and experience. And I, I'm going to ask you because I, I, I think the producer said you would have a little prepared. I think it's awesome and I want to know more about it. What can you tell me about the RDX, the retail demo experience, um, how this is evolving to, sh to support um, this new shopping environment and how is it going to play into the, the Microsoft or the experience overall? Yeah, so it, it, just kind of from a foundational level, so everyone on the on the live stream can get a grasp of what RDX is. It's the demo experience you have when you walk into a retail store and you walk up to a, a Windows 10 modern device and you have a chance to learn more about the benefits of the operating system, uh, learn more about the benefits of Microsoft 365. Of course, the OEM partner has a great story to tell there as well. And then the retailer, they may have, uh, you know, value add uh, or attach programs that they want to merchandise with the sale of that device as well. So RDX creates this great platform for all that storytelling to come to life and present itself to the customer when they're front and center with a device. So now we think, okay, we need to evolve that though, right? As I said before, we can't have customers uh, you know, or sorry, we can't assume that every customer is going to want to come into the store and, and engage physically with a device or stand next to a retail pro and have them uh, pitch them or, or, or you know, try to uh, upsell them on the device. So we're working around the clock to evolve RDX to this new normal, right? And provide the, the partners and our customers with these uh, handheld engagements so they can continue to learn about Windows, they can continue to evaluate and discover and compare the devices that they might be considering, you know, whether I'm going to buy this laptop or I'm going to buy this two in one or I'm going to buy this all in one. They, they can't lose that kind of, I say, tactile, but not in the literal sense, uh, ability to, to do the things that they would do when they go into a store to, to evaluate a device. So we're bringing all that information, bringing all that, uh, you know, interactive uh, engagement, um, kind of lifting it off the device, if you will, and, and presenting it to uh, our, our customers and, and our store associates in a way that they can continue their, their shopping without having to actually feel like they're perhaps maybe, you know, coming into contact with a device or, um, you know, perhaps being too close to another customer or an associate um, in a way that might make them feel uncomfortable. So yeah, again, it's just about, about delivering that great experience, but doing it in a safe and responsible way. So it, you know, I'm watching it and if, if, if people could see me on the live stream, it's the first time I've seen it, I get to see it in this little thing. I, I'm a little bit jealous that people get to see it full screen. That, that, that's really cool, John. And I Thank think you. it's amazing, obviously, what, what you've done in your, in, your, in your time at Microsoft and, and what Microsoft is doing obviously a leader in experiences, a leader in, in brand loyalty, and, and uh, it's, it's awesome to watch. John, I am so thankful you were able to come here today. I know it's a lot to get um, you know, big, big, big companies to, to have a voice sometimes as, as we never know what, what Andrew's gonna ask or gonna say. So I, I can't appreciate you more coming here and giving your insights. Um, I can't even get through all the audience questions that are happening. They're rolling so fast, but, and I know we're out of time, but can I ask you, um, you know, final thought, you know, whether, you know, whatever your thoughts are. And I know that, you know, from, from John, your 25 years experience, I don't care consumer side, I don't care retailer side. What, what do you want our audience to leave with about the future of the re future retail, future of experience, future of shopping? G give me your final thought, John, because I, I'm going to be hanging on it. You got a lot of experience and I love listening to you talk. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, I, I think in closing, I would just ask everyone watching to remember and acknowledge the importance of the physical store. Um, you know, I remember five, six, seven years ago, there was this kind of debate about showrooming and what would become of, of the physical store as a result of the you know explosion of, of uh, digital shopping. And we've seen the data. People still want to go in store. 90% of people who buy a, a device still at some point will go into that store to do some form of evaluation. And so we have to keep our eye on that reality and help our brick and mortar partners who 
obviously are, have been evolving their digital strategies rapidly as well to meet the new normal, but we have to help them continue to provide that great in-store experience and, and those great moments and those great engagement points and those interactions with their associates and their brands that can only really happen in a store. And so you know, as much as we're mobile first and as much as we are you know, just driven by e-commerce, um, we are all in on the physical shopping experience and our partners' uh, commitment to their brick and mortar business. Well, outstanding final thoughts, John. And I think that it was JFK who said, we do things not because they are easy, but because they are hard, right? This may not be easy, but these are the cards we're dealt. And um, you know, while we're, the, you're, you're exactly right. The physical store, while we have to adapt to the experience, it can't be, it can't be amended by something else. We're right. just going to have to figure out how to make it work and how to adapt to the customer experience, hard as it may be. Uh, but I, I am excited to see all the great things that Microsoft is doing. And I'm privileged. We're privileged to have you here on the show to share them with us. Thank you so much. And hopefully you'll come back. I'd love to. Thank you again. Thank you, John. Okay. Is Ms. Campbell coming back? We're going to do a wrap up. I think we got three minutes and we're going to get. No, Ms. Campbell is not coming back. My salt didn't work. Made my horn will work. <laughs> Technical difficulties all day long. Okay. In the last three minutes, we have, um, I won't even give it a final thought um, that we haven't already shared, right? So I think at the end of the day, um, between the physical store, between the digital experience, um, between all these elements working together to embrace this new normal, um, we do things because they are hard, not because they are easy. Um, and I ask all of us to stay the course in the words of Mr. Sean Ludick, um, honor your commitment to your customers. And on the other side of this, our brand experiences are gonna be even more amazing than before. So great conversations from Mr. Ludick, great thoughts uh, and conversations with, with Mr. Zach, uh, lovely hat, lovely beard, and of course, anchored by uh, the great thoughts by Mr. John. All right, it's been a privilege to have you here on this episode of the Hype Hour. We look forward to seeing you on another show. My name is Andrew Catapano. Sorry about uh, Miss Kelly Campbell. I, much better looking at her than me on the end of the show. But at the end of the day, this is what you get. It's been a pleasure having you in the hive. We'll see you at the next episode.